by Jesus on the cross, the people crying, looking on a man and thinking tragedy. But what this world could not see was when they nailed him to a tree. It would break the chains of sin, captivity. Love grew. Hi, my name is Darren Johnson. Welcome to our show. Now today, we'll have a teaching on the book of Ezekiel. The book of Ezekiel. In Ezekiel 38, 1-3 it says, And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Verse 2, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshech, and Tubal, and prophesy against him. Verse 3, And say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. God is telling Ezekiel to prophesy against a person named Gog and the land he is over called Magog, which is probably the middle of Turkey. He is also the chief prince of Tubal, which is probably the present day Siberia or eastern Turkey, and Meshach, which is probably present day Russia or Moscow. Now my friend, you need to know your Middle East geography. Otherwise these Places and words won't mean anything to you. Christian, know your geography. I know I keep saying it over and over again, but you need to know your geography. You need to know your history. You need to know your Bible. <laughs> you need to know your math and English for that matter, but you need to be smart in the Lord. Anyways, this would make him king of a country that is north or northeast of Israel. The final battle of Gog and Magog occurs at the end of the millennium after the devil is released from the bottomless pit. Look at Revelations 27 to 10. Download my book of Revelation. Download my other 47 books of the Bible, verse by verse commentaries. Christian, it's free. Learn your Bible. Know your Bible. Preach your Bible. You're certainly not going to get the truth from the government. Get it from God. In Ezekiel 38, 4 to 6, it says, And I will turn thee back, and put hooks into thy jaws, and I will bring thee forth, and all thine army, horses and horsemen, all of them, clothed with all sorts of armor, even a great company, with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Verse 5, Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya with them, all of them with shield and helmet. Verse 6, Gomer and all his bands, the house of Togarmoth of the north quarters, and all his bands, and many people with thee. Gomer is probably western Turkey. Togarmoth is probably the present day of Armenia or Russia. Ethiopia, in Ezekiel's time, is still Ethiopia today. Libya is the west neighbor of the country of Egypt, which is southwest of Israel. So along with Gog, the following countries that helped him in battle will be turned back as well. Bands, or groups of soldiers, and a buckler is a small round shield. So we see a great army from the north as well as the south, coming to attack the nation of Israel. In Ezekiel 38, 7-9 it says, Be thou prepared, and prepare for thyself, thou and all thy company, that are assembled unto thee, and be thou a guard unto them. Verse 8, After many days thou shalt be visited, in the latter days thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword, and is gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel, which have been always laid. But it is brought forth out of the nation, and they shall dwell safely, all of them. Verse 9, Thou shalt ascend and come like a storm. Thou shalt be like a cloud to cover the land. Thou and all thy bands, and many people with thee. So the nation of Israel is the land that is brought back from the sword, and out of the nations. This occurred at the end of the tribulation, and completed in the beginning of the millennium. The latter days is referred to the end of the millennium. When Gog and his fellow nations attack Israel in battle, they are likened to a rainstorm where first the sky gets dark with the clouds covering the land, and then a heavy rainfall. In Ezekiel 38, 10 to 13, it says, Thus saith the Lord God, it shall also come to pass, that at the same time shall things come into thy mind, 
and thou shalt think an evil thought. Verse 11, And thou shalt say, I will go up to the land of unwalled villages. I will go to them that are oppressed, and that dwell safely, all them dwelling without walls, and having neither bars nor gates. Verse 12, To take a spoil, and to take a prey, to turn thine hand upon the desolate places that are now inhabited, and upon the people that are gathered out of the nations, which have gotten cattle and goods, that dwell in the midst of the land. Verse 13, Sheba and Dedan, and the merchants of Tarshish, with all thy young lions thereof, shall say unto thee, Art thou come to take a spoil? Hast thou gathered thy company to take a prey, to carry away silver and gold, to take away cattle and goods, to take a great spoil? When Gog and his fellow nations come to attack Israel, they will have evil thoughts against God in the land. After Jesus takes over the world in the millennium, hallelujah, there will be no need for war, because there will be a worldwide peace, as well as peace in Israel. For those of you who hate God and trying to get rid of God and think we're rid of God with all this homosexual stuff and evolution and all the other nonsense going on in this country and in the world, well, I got some bad news for you. Islam, Catholicism, all that nonsense. One day, Jesus comes back. He takes over the world. A thousand years of peace. Worldwide theocracy. So, why don't you just join the winning side and get it over with. Get saved, serve the Lord today, and be blessed in this life and the life to come. But I digress. So, when Jesus takes over the world in the millennium, hence you have unwalled villages and cities without walls, gates and bars in Israel, where there is peace. Hey, if there's peace in a perfect government, you're not going to need walls or bars, so on and so forth. The land of Israel will be full of livestock, crops, goods and riches, as well as being ruled by our Savior, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Dedan is the northwest coast of the Persian Gulf. Tarshish is a country of Lebanon. The countries of Sheba, Dedan, and Tarshish will go to Gog and his fellow nations and ask him, Are you come to the nation of Israel to overrun it? And are you going to take the spoil of the gold, silver, cattle, and goods? They are saying this with a surprise because it is ridiculous to think you can attack the creator of the universe. The Colossians 1.16. And be victorious during the millennium. Hence the devil is the only one that is proud and wicked enough to attack. And he is the one behind the army plans in his failed attack against Jesus at the end of the millennium. In Ezekiel 38.14-16 it says, Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say unto God, Thus saith the Lord God, In that day, when my people of Israel dwell safely, shalt thou know it? Verse 15, And thou shalt come from thy place, out of the north parts, thou and many people with thee, and all of them riding upon horses, a great company, and a mighty army. Verse 16, And thou shalt come up against my people of Israel, as a cloud that covered the land. It shall be in the latter days, and I will bring thee against my land, that the heathen may know me, when I shall be sanctified in thee, O God, before their eyes. The battle happens at the end of the millennium. Revelations 27 and 9. Since the only time Israel is at peace and dwelling safely as an independent nation is during the millennium. The land of Magog is north of Israel. And by the way, Syria and Turkey are north, whereas Russia is northeast on your current day map. So if you have Israel here, you have, well, I guess put it in reverse. If you have Israel here, you have Syria, Turkey, Russia. BibleAtlas.org. Know your geography, Christian. So when God is defeated, all the lost people in the world will know that the Lord is God and he will be set apart or sanctified in their eyes. In Ezekiel 38, 17 and 19, it says, Thus saith the Lord God, Art thou he of whom I have spoken in old time by my servants, the prophets of Israel, which prophesied in those days many years that I would bring thee against them? Verse 18, And it shall come to pass at the same time when Gog shall come against the land of Israel, saith the Lord God, that my fury shall come up in my face. Verse 19, For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath have I spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel. God to the prophets prophesies or predicts the future with 100% accuracy every time. Now beware of groups like the National Response Squad that claim to find error with the prophecies of Ezekiel and other prophets. Or rather such foolish organizations online that think they're smarter than God. You know the average lost person or carnal Christian 
never study the Old Testament, nor do they understand Israel's place of prophecy. That's why it's so hilarious when they come with these ridiculous prophecies or these ridiculous contradictions. And they don't even know what the Bible says. And I can help with that, Christian. All 17 prophets, verse by verse commentary, intertwined, interconnected with the rest of the Bible, everything explained with great detail. You don't have to be a blind man walking in the dark. Okay, you can know your Bible. You can know what the prophets say. You can know when they are in the Bible and who they're talking to and why they're there. Look, Christian, three quarters of your Bible shouldn't be a mystery to you. It should be like your math book. After you've passed the course, you should understand it all. Or at least enough of it to where you can apply it in life and be successful. Otherwise, you're going to be led around by other foolish people who the blind lead in the blind, you'll fall in the ditch. You can't figure out why nothing ever works out right. Well, if you knew your Bible, you'd understand. The Battle of Gog and Magog happens at the end of the millennium, whereas the Battle of Armageddon happens at the end of the Tribulation. In both cases, God is fighting Satan and his forces, which all originated in Genesis 3.15. Many of the prophecies may be talking about the restoration of Israel after the Babylonian captivity, and then the restoration of Israel in the millennium. You notice how the Bible always revolves around Israel them becoming a nation, them going into captivity, them being restored, them going into captivity again, them going back as a nation again, so on and so forth. Know your Hebrew history, know your Bible history, <laughs> know your history, because nowadays they keep changing it to make it fit their political objectives. That's what you get in America. Political correctness. Looks good, sounds good. Political activism, not truth. Sometimes God talks about his first coming and then his second coming. God wrote his book so that the more holy you get, the more you'll understand. Mark it down, my friend. Lost people and carnal Christians usually wrestle with the scriptures to their own destruction. 2 Peter 3.16 By coming up with the wrong interpretation. 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 1, 19-20 in Ezekiel 38, 20-23, it says, So that the fishes of the sea, and the fowls of the heaven, and the beasts of the field, and all creeping things that creep upon the earth, and all the men that are upon the face of the earth, shall shake at my presence, and the mountains shall be thrown down, and the steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground. Verse 21, And I will call for a sword against him throughout all my mountains, saith the Lord God. Every man's sword shall be against his brother. Verse 22, And I will plead against him with pestilence and with blood, and I will rain upon him, and upon his bands, and upon the many people that are with him, and overflowing rain, and great hailstones, fire, and brimstone. Verse 23, Thus will I magnify myself, and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations, and they shall know that I am the Lord. The battle of Gog and Magog ends with fire coming down from heaven, and consuming the devil's army. The fire will consist of hailstones, fire, and brimstone. When all the nature and humanity feel the land shaking because of the fury of God, they will shake or tremble at the presence of the Lord. The mountains will fall down, along with every wall in the day of God's wrath, at the final battle against Satan. God will be sanctified or set apart, as well as magnified for all the earth, and everyone will know that God is the Lord. In Ezekiel 39, 1-5, it says, Therefore, thou, son of man, prophesy against Gog and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O God, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. Verse 2, And I will turn thee back, and leave but the sixth part of thee, and will cause thee to come up from the north parts, and will bring thee upon the mountains of Israel. Verse 3, And I will smite thy bow out of thy left hand, and will cause thine arrows to fall out of thy right hand. Verse 4, Thou shalt fall upon the mountains of Israel, thou and all thy bands, and the people that is with thee. I will give thee unto the ravenous birds of every sort, and to the beasts of the fields to be devoured. Verse 5, Thou shalt fall upon the open field, for I have spoken it, saith the Lord God. This is a different battle than in Ezekiel 38, because for every six people in Gog's army, five will be killed. The slain will be a meal for the birds and beasts. Look at Revelations 19, 11, 21. 
which would make it part of the Battle of Armageddon, or a battle going on at the same time. Notice, it says God's name won't be polluted anymore, which occurs at the beginning of the millennium. Since the battle in Ezekiel 38 and 39 are different, then this would imply Gog is a title of a leader of Magog, like Pharaoh is a title of a leader in ancient Egypt. Hence the Gog of Magog attacks God's army twice, at the end of the tribulation and at the end of the millennium. And both battles occur in Israel, once when the Antichrist is reigning, and another when Christ is reigning. In Ezekiel 39:68, it says, And I will send a fire on Magog, and among them that dwell carelessly in the isles, and they shall know that I am the Lord. Verse 7, So will I make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not let them pollute my holy name any more. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord the Holy One in Israel. Verse 8, Behold, it is come, and it is done, saith the Lord God. This is the day whereof I have spoken. Magog is north of Israel, whereas the isles are islands in the Mediterranean Sea west of Israel. At the end of the tribulation, God will send a fire on the land of Magog and the islands in the Mediterranean Sea. The people of Israel will know God's holiness as a result of this battle. If it were in the millennium, they would have already known God's holiness, nor would they have polluted God's name. In the beginning of the tribulation, Israel was a lost nation that chose the Antichrist as their Messiah. In the middle of the tribulation, they repented and chose Jesus as their Messiah. The heathen or lost people will be judged at the end of the tribulation, Matthew 25, 31-46. By the way, when God speaks it, it is done or 100% guaranteed that it will happen. In Ezekiel 39, 9-10 it says, And they that dwell in the cities of Israel shall go forth, and shall set on fire and burn the weapons, both the shields and the bucklers, the bows and the arrows, and the hand staves and the spears, and they shall burn them with fire seven years. Verse 10, So that they shall take no wood out of the field, neither cut down any of the forests. For they shall burn the weapons with fire, and they shall spoil those that spoil them, and rob those that rob them, saith the Lord God. The nation of Israel goes into the wilderness for three and a half years, look at Revelations 12, 13 and 17, before re-entering the land of Israel. After the battle of Armageddon ends, followed by the judgment of the nations, the millennium will begin. They will spend the first seven years burning the weapons of the defeated enemies of the Antichrist army. There will be so much to burn that no tree will need to be cut down for seven years. While they are collecting the weapons of the fallen enemy to burn, they will also collect the spoil or valuables on the fallen enemy soldiers. As a result, the ones that spoiled and robbed God's people during the seven year tribulation will in the end be robbed and spoiled by God's people for God's glory. In Ezekiel 39, 11 to 13, it says, And it shall come to pass in that day, that I will give unto Gog a place there of graves in Israel, the valley of the pastors on the east of the sea, and it shall stop the noses of the pastors. And there shall they bury Gog and all his multitude, and they shall call it the valley of Hamangong. Verse 12, And seven months shall the house of Israel be burying of them, that they may cleanse the land. Verse 13, Yea, all the people of the land shall bury them, and it shall be to them a renown the day that I shall be glorified, saith the Lord God. The fallen bodies of the army of God will be buried in the valley east of the sea in Israel, which will be called the valley of Hamangong. The stink of the dead bodies will cause those that walk by to hold their noses because of the smell. The bodies of the army of God will take seven months to bury. As a result, the land of Israel will be cleansed. And under Mosaic law, touching a dead body would make one unclean until the end of the day or the evening. In Ezekiel 39, 14-16 it says, And they shall sever out men of continual employment, passing through the land to bury with the passengers, those that remain upon the face of the earth, to cleanse it. After the end of seven months shall they search. Verse 15, And the passengers that pass through the land, when any seeth a man's bone, then shall I set up a sign by it, till the barriers have buried it in the valley of Hamangog. Verse 16, And also the name of the city shall be Hamanah. Thus shall they cleanse the land. During the seven-month burial process of the fallen army of God, whenever a bone is found, a sign will be put up. This way, those that do the burying will quickly pick up the bones 
and bring them to the valley of Hammondog. So you have passengers identifying the location of the bones of those who bury, picking up the bones, and burying them. The city that contains or is next to Hammondog will be called Hammondog in the land cleansing process. In Ezekiel 39, 17-20 it says, And thou, son of man, thus saith the Lord God, Speak unto every feathered fowl, and to every beast of the field. Assemble yourselves, and come gather yourselves on every side to my sacrifice, that I do sacrifice to you, even a great sacrifice upon the mountains of Israel, that ye may eat flesh and drink blood. Verse 18, Ye shall eat the flesh of the mighty, and drink the blood of the princes of the earth, of rams, of lambs, and of goats, of bullocks, all of them fatlings of Bashan. Verse 19, And ye shall eat fat till ye be full, and drink blood till ye be drunken, of my sacrifice which I have sacrificed for you. Verse 20, Thus ye shall be filled at my table with horses and chariots, with mighty men, and with all men of war, saith the Lord God. This is a clear reference to what will happen at the end of the battle of Armageddon. Look at Revelations 19, 19 and 21. The Lord will prepare a great sacrifice and meal for the beasts and the birds, the fallen soldiers of the Antichrist army, and the animals they rode upon. In Ezekiel 39, 21-24 it says, And I will set my glory among the heathen, and all the heathen shall see my judgment that I have executed, and my hand that I have laid upon them. So the house of Israel shall know that I am the Lord their God from that day and forward. Verse 23, And the heathen shall know that the house of Israel went into captivity for their iniquity, because they trespassed against me. Therefore I hid my face from them, and gave them into the hand of their enemies. So fell they all by the sword. Verse 24, According to their uncleanness, and according to their transgressions, have I done unto them, and hid my face from them. As a result of the fall of the army of Gog at the end of the tribulation, the nation of Israel will be restored from that day and forever. The nation of Israel in Israel will know that the Lord is the true God and Messiah. Look at Isaiah 9, 6 7. The heathen that will be killed at the judgment of the nations will realize that the nation of Israel went to captivity because of their sins. This is why the nation of Israel fell by the sword at the hand of their enemies, because they forgot God, Psalms 9, 17. They were judged according to their sins, Psalms 32, 23. And as a result, God hid his face from them. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. In Ezekiel 39, 25 and 27, it says, Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Now will I bring again the captivity of Jacob, and have mercy upon the whole house of Israel, and will be jealous for my holy name. Verse 26, After that they have borne their shame, and all their trespasses, whereby they have trespassed against me, when they dwelt safely in their land, and none made them afraid. Verse 27, When I have brought them again from the people, and gather them out of their enemies' lands, and have sanctified them in the sight of many nations. The captivity of Jacob back into the land of Israel happened after the battle of Armageddon. The nation of Israel that was in the wilderness for three and a half years, Revelations 12, 13 to 17, will be brought back into the land of Israel, just like it was in the days of Joshua, in the book of Joshua. The nation of Israel went into captivity because they went after idols, abominations, and detestable things after God had brought them into the land of Israel and gave them peace and blessings. Because of their sins, the nation of Israel was scattered worldwide. Look at Deuteronomy 28, 64, and 65. Because of God's name's sake, the people of Israel will be gathered worldwide and brought back into the land of Israel as one unified nation. As a result, God will be set apart or sanctified in the sight of many nations of the world. Look at Micah 4, 5. In Ezekiel 39, 28-29, it says, Then shall they know that I am the Lord their God, which caused them to be led into captivity among the heathen. But I have gathered them unto their own land, and have left none of them any more there. Verse 29, Neither will I hide my face any more from them, for I have poured out my spirit upon the house of Israel, saith the Lord God. When God defeats the Antichrist army and restores the people of Israel throughout the whole world into the land of Israel, then will the Jews know that God is the Lord. Look at 1 John 5, 7. They will realize that God was righteous when he sent the nation of Israel into captivity. Notice that God poured out his spirit upon the nation of Israel, which happens before the second coming of Christ. Look at Acts 2, 16-21. Now, we will continue with our lesson on the book of Ezekiel 
But now we'll pause for a commercial. What does the Bible say about abortion? Look, abortion is plainly murder. You know, God always recognized a person in the womb. If you look at Genesis 25, verse 23, the Bible said, And the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. You know, now, if it's a person in the womb, and it's not a fetus, and we kill it, it's plainly murder. And you know, in the Ten Commandments, the Bible says, Thou shalt not kill. Now, look, a lot of people say, Look, I'm tired of people putting their morals on me, you know, in society. But look, we don't want to get religion out of our morals in society. We want to get sin and unrighteousness out of our morals in society. The Bible says that sin is a reproach to any people. Now, we don't hate the sinner. We hate the sin. Look, you've committed abortion. Look, God can forgive you. He loves you. He still wants to save you. You can still serve him. But you just got to put it behind you and just do what's right. Okay? Now, Christians, look, abortion is murder. Now, Christians, we need to unite in the state of Louisiana against abortion. You know why? It's God's way. It's the right way. It's the Bible way. What does the Bible say about evolution? You know, in the textbooks, they teach you that billions of years ago, there was a big bang, and the whole universe came to existence. And millions of years ago, life came from non-life, and from that one-celled amoeba, eventually came an animal, and eventually a human. But you know, the Bible teaches otherwise. It says in Genesis 1-1 that in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. You know, the Bible teaches that God created the heaven and earth in six literal days, 6,000 years ago. And on day six, he created Adam and Eve with the ability to reproduce. And from Adam and Eve came the whole population of the world. Now, evolution attacks and undermines the Christian faith and the authority of the Bible. Now, if you'd like more information on creation, just go to our website, which will be shown you at the end of the show, and you can go to the link on creation and learn more. But look, we don't hate the sinner, we hate the sin. Look, if you believe in evolution, look, God can forgive you. If you're lost, he can still save you. Just forsake it, believe what God did, and get on with your life. Now, Christians, we need to teach our kids, we need to teach our church members, and we need to teach people in the world that God created the world we didn't evolve from an animal. You know why? It's God's way. It's the right way. It's the Bible way. All right, continue with our lesson on the book of Ezekiel. In Ezekiel 41 to 2, it says, In the five and twentieth year of our captivity, in the beginning of the year, in the tenth day of the month, in the fourteenth year after that the city was smitten, in the selfsame day, the hand of the Lord was upon me and brought me thither. Verse 2. In the visions of God brought he me into the land of Israel and set me up upon a very high mountain, by which was as a frame of a city on the south. The captivity of the nation of Israel began when Nebuchadnezzar's brother, King Zedekiah, took over the nation of Israel. So the 25th year of captivity would be 14 years after the fall of Jerusalem to the Babylonian army. God's hand is upon Ezekiel to carry him off in a vision to see the future. The same thing happened to John the Apostle. Look at Revelations 4, 1-2. Ezekiel is taken to see the Millennial Temple in the land of Israel upon a high mountain during the Millennial Reign of Christ. In Ezekiel 43-4 says, And he brought me thither, and behold there was a man whose appearance was like the appearance of brass, with a line of flax in his hand and a measuring reed, and he stood in the gate. Verse 4, And he said to me, Son of man, Behold with thine eyes, and hear with thine ears, and set thine heart upon all that I show thee. For to the intent that I might show them unto thee art thou brought hither. Declare all that thou seest to the house of Israel. Ezekiel meets a man in the vision, evidently an angel. The angel has an appearance of brass, which could be the Lord Jesus Christ, says an angel of the Lord. Look at Revelation 115. This person has a line of flax, and a measuring reed to measure the dimensions of the temple and the surroundings thereof. Ezekiel was to absorb everything he saw and heard so he could declare the vision to the nation of Israel in the Babylonian captivity. What follows next in Ezekiel is the exact blueprint of the Millennial Temple. 
In Ezekiel 45 or 6 it says, And behold, a wall on the outside of the house round about, and in the man's hand a measuring reed of six cubits long, by the cubit and in hand breadth. So he measured the breadth of the building, one reed, and the height, one reed. Verse 6, Then came he unto the gate which looketh toward the east, and went up the stairs thereof, and measured the threshold of the gate, which was one reed broad, and the other threshold of the gate, which was one reed broad. The angel or man has a measuring reed, which is a total length of nine feet and three inches, of six cubits long, or nine feet, and a hand breadth, which is four fingers, or three inches. There is a wall round about the house of God, or the temple. The breadth or thickness of this wall is nine feet and three inches, and the height of this wall is nine feet and three inches. On the east side, which is facing the Euphrates River, there is a gate that has stairs going up to this gate, which the angel or man walked up to measure the threshold of the gate. A threshold is a piece of wood or stone placed beneath the door, usually the place where you enter a building or a complex. Under the gate, when you enter it, on the east side, it had two thresholds of nine feet and three inches across. In Ezekiel 47 to 9, it says, And every little chamber was one reed long, and one reed broad. And between the little chambers were five cubits. And the threshold of the gate, by the porch of the gate, within was one reed. Verse 8, He measured also the porch of the gate within one reed. Verse 9, Then measured he the porch of the gate, eight cubits, and the post thereof, two cubits. And the porch of the gate was inward. Evidently, when you pass through the gate, you saw chambers or rooms that are 9 feet and 3 inches square. So you're passing a wall that's 9 feet 3 inches tall, 9 feet 3 inches wide. You're going over two thresholds which are 9 feet 3 inches, and you're walking and you're seeing rooms that are 9 feet 3 inches. Now between these chambers, there was 5 cubits, or 7.5 feet apart. So you'd have a room of 9 feet 3 inches, 7.5 feet space so on and so forth. The gate had a porch that was eight cubits or 12 feet long and one reed or nine feet and three inches deep. It had two posts at the ends of the porch of the gate that were evidently two cubits or three feet thick. This would be like walking up the stairs to someone's house that had an outside porch and inside the house there were several rooms, one reed squared and five cubits apart. Evidently there are three gates mentioned here the threshold of the gate by the porch of the gate, the porch of the gate within, and the porch of the gate that appears to be the gates between the third chamber going backward, ending where the threshold of the gate by the porch of the gate begins in the middle. Now this is why you, you should be looking at a diagram of a millennial temple when you read this stuff. It will help you understand it better. I know I'm trying to describe it visibly by words. But if you download my book of Ezekiel chapter 40, you know, you'll see that there's a website there for the millennial temple and it gives you all the details. But remember, the temple's important. You know, when Solomon built the temple and the nation of Israel, that was important. The tabernacle with Moses was important, because that's where they met with God. And each piece of furniture, each diagram, all the construction, it's all there to glorify God. And of course, there's a temple in heaven. Look at Revelation 15. So, if it's important to God, it should be important to you, Christian. In Ezekiel 40, 10 to 11, it says, And the little chambers of the gate eastward were three on this side and three on that side. They three were of one measure, and the posts had one measure on this side and on that side. And he measured the breadth of the entry of the gate, 10 cubits, and the length of the gate, 13 cubits. So there's three chambers or rooms on each side of the eastern gate going inward. They were all the same size with the same post size. Now a post is a stake of wood set upright into the ground to serve as a marker or support. The entry of the eastern gate was 10 cubits or 15 feet long. And the gate between the little chambers was 13 cubits or 19 and a half feet long. In Ezekiel 40, 12 to 13 it says, The space also before the little chambers was one cubit on this side and the space was one cubit on that side. And the little chambers were six cubits on this side and six cubits on that side. Verse 13, he measured then the gate from the roof of one little chamber to the roof of another. The breadth was five and twenty cubits, door against door. So the space between the chamber and the entry of the eastern gate was one cubits on each side. 
evidently the little chambers had 36 square feet and the thickness of the walls were one and a half inches. Evidently the thickness of the entry of the gate itself would have had to be six inches on both sides. Hence you do the math and there you go. And from the little chamber to the little chamber you have 25 cubits across. The space of chi and of course the space of five cubits between the little chambers is a gate because it says door against door. In Ezekiel 42, 1 to 3, it says, Then he brought me forth into the utter court, the way toward the north. And he brought me into the chamber that was over against the separate place, and which was before the building toward the north. Before the length of an hundred cubits was the north door, and the breadth was fifty cubits. Over against the twenty cubits, which were for the inner court, and over against the pavement, which was for the utter court, was gallery against gallery and three stories. On the northern and southern side of the temple are the priest chambers or rooms. They are next to the sacred place of the inner court on both the north and south sides. These chambers are 100 cubits long and 50 cubits wide, 150 by 75 feet. There is a door right in the middle of the 100 cubits side facing the north. There is an inner court of 20 cubits that separates the two three-story galleries. In Ezekiel 42.13 it says, Then said he unto me, The north chambers and the south chambers, which are before the separate place, they be holy chambers, where the priests that approach unto the Lord shall eat the most holy things. There shall they lay the most holy things, and the meat offering, and the sin offering, and the trespass offering, for the place is holy. Now, I have skipped Ezekiel 40, verse 17, to chapter 42, verse 12, because it talks more about the temple and what it looks like in details and just go to the website and look that up in the diagrams it'll help you you'll get more done faster however I'm jumping back in where the priest duties are being mentioned and here we see the priest chambers are holy chambers the fact that the priests live in the temple complex which includes the inner and outer court signifies that God and man dwelled together in the millennium. In the Old Testament tabernacle, the priests didn't live permanently in the tabernacle, but only as long as the anointing or the terms of their service lasted. In the millennium, these priests will have a term of a thousand years. In these chambers, the priests shall prepare for sacrifice and eat the holy things, the meat offering, the sin offering, and the trespass offering. Now, the Levitical priesthood ended when Jesus died on the cross. But remember, in the millennium, Jesus is the high priest, after the order of Melchizedek, look at Hebrews chapter 7. So it's a new priesthood, with a new, with a new priest, Jesus, an everlasting priesthood. So they're still giving sacrifices, but they're looking after Jesus died on the cross, not looking forward to the cross. But the good thing during the millennium is Jesus will be there in person. In Ezekiel 42, 14, it says, When the priests enter therein, then shall they not go out of the holy place into the utter court, but there they shall lay their garments wherein they minister, for they are holy, and shall put on other garments, and shall approach to those things which are for the people. When the priests enter the holy chambers, they are not to leave the chambers and go out the eastern gate into the utter court with the same clothes they went in with. They have to change their clothes before they leave the complex and perform the duties for the people, in terms of the sacrifices. In Ezekiel 42, 15 to 20, it says, Now when he had made an end of measuring the inner house, he brought me forth toward the gate whose prospect is toward the east, and measured it round about. Verse 16, he measured the east side with the measuring reed, 500 reeds with the measuring reed round about. Verse 17, he measured the north side, 500 reeds with the measuring reed round about. Verse 18, he measured the south side, 500 reeds with the measuring reed, Verse 19, he turned about to the west side and measured 500 reeds with the measuring reed. Verse 20, he measured it by the four sides. It had a wall round about 500 reeds long and 500 broad to make a separation between the sanctuary and the profane place. The wall surrounding the outer court is 500 reeds square, or 4,500 feet square, or 1,500 yards square. Remember, a mile is 1,760 yards, so that's about 8,500 of a mile square. 
This separated the sanctuary from the profane place or the land outside of the sanctuary complex. In Ezekiel 43, 1-3 it says, Afterward he brought me to the gate, even the gate that looketh toward the east. Verse 2, And behold, the glory of the God of Israel came from the way of the east, and his voice was like a noise of many waters, and the earth shined with his glory. Verse 3, And it was according to the appearance of the vision which I saw, even according to the vision that I saw when it came to destroy the city. And the visions were like the vision that I saw by the river Kibar, and I fell upon my face. The angel brings the prophet Ezekiel to the eastern outer gate, where he sees the glory of God of Israel enter through, which happens to be Jesus. God sounded like the noise of many waters, and the earth shined round him because of his glory. By the way, the sun rises in the east of the earth and sets in the west. The appearance of the glory of God was the same appearance that he saw in a previous vision where the city of Jerusalem is destroyed. Look at Ezekiel 9.3. Ezekiel 43.4-6 says, And the glory of the Lord came into the house by the way of the gate, whose prospect is toward the east. Verse 5, So the Spirit took me up and brought me into the inner court, and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the house. Verse 6, And I heard him speaking unto me out of the house, and the man stood by me. The glory of the Lord enters the millennial temple to the eastern inner gate. Ezekiel is taken up in the spirit to go from the entrance of the outer eastern gate to the inner court and from the entrance of the millennial temple. From the temple, Ezekiel hears God speaking to him. The same thing happened when God entered the tabernacle through the tabernacle door and sat on the mercy seat and then spoke to Moses from the inside of the tabernacle. By the way, it was the glory of the Lord, or God the Father, that led the children of Israel through the wilderness and into the land of Canaan. Look at Exodus 40, 34, 38. And of course, the angel of the Lord was Jesus. And Jesus fought their battles for them. Look at Joshua 5, 13, 15, and Acts 7, 45. Remember that God the Father has a spiritual marriage covenant with the nation of Israel, whereas Jesus has a spiritual marriage covenant with the Gentile New Testament Church, Ephesians 5.23. And in both cases, it's male marrying female. God is not a homosexual. God is not for homosexual marriage. God finds homosexuality an abomination, Leviticus 18.22, Romans 1.27. Christian, there is no room for acceptance of homosexuality. It's sin, it's wrong. Just an aside there for you. In Ezekiel 43, 7-8 it says, And he said unto me, Son of man, the place of my throne, and the place of the soles of my feet, where I will dwell in the midst of the children of Israel forever, in my holy name shall the house of Israel no more defile, neither they nor their kings by their whoredom, nor by the carcasses of their kings in their high places. Verse 8, In their setting of their thresholds by my thresholds, in their posts by my posts, and the wall between me and them, they have even defiled my holy name by their abominations that they have committed. Wherefore, I have consumed them in mine anger. This is Jesus talking to Ezekiel. He's telling Ezekiel that the millennial temple will be the place of his throne on earth and the place of the soles of his feet. He will dwell there forever, Isaiah 9, 6, 7, in charge of an eternal worldwide holy government. God promises that from the beginning of the millennial reign of Christ, and forever, his holy name will never be defiled by the people of Israel, nor their kings. He promises that idolatry and false god worship will be done away with. Look at Zechariah 13, 3-4. A threshold is a piece of wood or stone placed beneath a door. A post is a piece of wood, usually long and square, or cylindrical, set upright to support a building. The point here is that the nation of Israel, all twelve tribes, have forsaken the threshold and posts of God's temple and created their own thresholds and posts for their high places and altars to their false gods and idols. Also, they have defiled the temple in Jerusalem with their idolatry and abominations. Look at Ezekiel chapter 8. This is why God consumed the Jews and the nations of Israel and Judah in his anger. In America, we have a similar problem. We defile God's house with the wrong music. 
country, rock, rap music in the church services, and they call it Christian contemporary. Now, Christian, don't call sin holy and then put God's name on something he doesn't approve of. There's, there's right music and there's wrong music. And for more information, download my teaching on New Testament church music. And of course, with the bad music, it comes with the people who don't dress properly. A Christian, you should be clothed, and you should, and men should look like men, and women should look like women. And clothes should draw attention to your godly character, not your body. Now, some churches in America have idolatrous pictures and statues in their churches. They use modern copyrighted versions, you know, NIV, ESV, New King James, NEV. Instead of the perfectly preserved Old King James Bible for the English-speaking people, Psalms 12, 6, and 7. Not to mention churches have watered down the preaching and outside evangelism to get bigger congregations, bigger offerings, and more prestige with others. Look at 1 Timothy 6, 5. As a result, they have brought the some or all the world into the church while driving some or all the holiness out of it. Look at 1 John 2, 15-17. This is how you can have a so-called church on every corner in America and sin running rampant and dominating people's lives throughout the land. You know, in America, five out of six people claim to be Christian. The truth of the matter is, real Christianity, less than 1%. And if you want more information on how to be a Christian, watch my seven-minute video on how to go to heaven and be 100% sure when you die you can go to heaven. Notice that in modern churches, they are excited about their new church building or prospective new church building. They will have painting and descriptions to show all the people, yet they act like the scriptures on the Millennial Temple in Ezekiel are boring and insignificant. You know, the greatest church building ever built is the Millennial Temple. Think about it, Christian. Now, if it's the greatest building that ever was built, and Jesus is going to live there for a thousand years and rule over the world from there, from the mountains in Israel, Isaiah 2, 2. Don't you think you should know the details about it and why it's there and what it means? And for more information on all these books I'm quoting, I've got 47 books, verse-by-verse -verse commentary of the Bible. Download it, Christian. It's free in your price range. No love offering required. I want you to know your Bible preach your Bible, teach your Bible, apply your Bible. The government certainly isn't going to teach you anything spiritual. But I digress. As a result, the Millennial Temple and the applications thereof are rarely, if ever, taught or referenced. That shouldn't be Christian. Don't forget that the Temple and the surrounding structures will be the only one on Earth in the Millennium where Jesus himself will sit and all the saved and their eternal bodies from Adam the post-tribulation martyrs will be in attendance in perfect service and worship. I hope that teaching was a blessing to you. But if you're lost and not saved, when you die, you'll go to hell and then the lake of fire. But if you'd like to escape hell and the lake of fire, I'm going to take some time right now and show you how you can be 100% sure when you die, you can go to heaven. I'm going to show you how to go to heaven. Now, the first thing on how to go to heaven is knowing that you're a sinner. Now, we'll start with this picture right here. Now, sin makes you dirty on the inside. You know, the Bible says that the thought of foolishness is sin. You ever made a dirty thought? Made a wicked thought? Made you feel dirty on the inside? Well, that's what sin will do. Sin is when you break God's law. Do you ever disobey your parents? Well, the Bible says... Uh, honor thy father and thy mother. So kids, you ever do what's wrong? Well, hey, that's a sin. You ever uh, steal before? The Bible says, thou shalt not steal. Anyway, sin is when you break God's law and it'll make you guilty on the inside. Hey, we've all sinned, okay? I sin, you sin. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Once you recognize you're a sinner, then you need to recognize God has to punish sin. Now, why do parents punish their kids? For being bad, right? Well, why would God punish you? Same reason. Now, you notice there's two places where a person can go. Either the heaven or the lake of fire. Okay? Now, why would a person go to the lake of fire? 
Bible says, for the wages of sin is death. Okay? God has to be just and punish our sins, just like you have to punish your kids when they're bad. But the Bible says, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. God provides a way to heaven, and that's through Jesus. Now, what did Jesus do on the cross? He died for our sins. Now, the Bible says that in 1 John 5.20, it says, And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may know Him that is true, and we are in Him that is true, even in His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. So Jesus, He's the Son of God, He's God, and He's eternal life. So we have to go to God, the one who died on the cross, was buried, and rose from the dead three days later for our sins, for forgiveness. Now, another thing you need to do is you need to repent. You need to turn to God from your sins. The Bible says, I tell you nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Now, these people right here, who do you think God could forgive? Well, they've got a change of heart. He doesn't have a change of heart. That's what repentance is. It's, turn, it's a change of heart towards God. Your want to changes, okay? Yeah. When you want to change, then God can forgive you. You can't be sorry that you just got caught, okay? You gotta be sorry and want to change, okay? Then once you have a repentant heart, let me show you what to do next. The Bible says in 1 John 1, 7, that it's the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, that cleanses us from all sin, okay? Now, what God wants to do, he wants to forgive all of your sin. He wants to forgive your past sin, your present sin, and your future sin, once for all, by his blood. Now, so once all your sins are forgiven, hey, where would you go? Heaven. Hey, if my past sins and my present sins and my future sins are all gone, I'm going to heaven. And then the Bible says that when we get forgiven, that the Spirit of God comes in. And when we, have spirit, uh, when we have the Spirit of God within us, we know we're saved. The Bible says in Ephesians 1.13, that in whom, ye also, I'm sorry, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Okay? You know, when you get sealed by God's Spirit, it's like being born into God's family. Now, when you got born, you were born into a bloodline, right? Now, does that ever change? Of course not. Once you're born to a bloodline, it's forever. Well, in the same way, once you're born into God's bloodline, He seals you, it's forever. It's eternal. It will never change. Now notice, it's not by good works. Now don't get me wrong, God wants you to be good, okay? After you're saved, He wants you to go to church. He wants you to get baptized. He wants you to read the Bible. He wants you to pray. He wants you to do what's right. But works will never save you. Hey, were you born into your family's bloodline because you were good? No. You were born that way. Hey, if you do something bad, can you be unborn out of your family's bloodline? No. It never changes. It's eternal. See, the Bible says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. By the washing of regeneration, and renewing of the Holy Ghost, okay? The blood washes us clean, the Spirit of God comes in, we are saved forever, okay? Now, if you would like to have all your sins forgiven, this is what you gotta do, okay? Now, if you would like to be forgiven, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pray out loud like I want God to forgive me, and if you wanna be forgiven, you just pray along and just ask God to forgive you, okay? Now, the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Anyone can do it anywhere. You just got to mean it in your heart, okay? Now, if you're just going to laugh and not be serious, you'll be like this guy. But if you're serious and you want to change and trust his blood only, he can save you. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to bow my head. I'm going to pray out loud like I want God to forgive me. And I'll say a few words. I'll pause. Then you can pray, and I'll say a few more words, you can and then I'll pause, you can pray, and you can ask the Lord to save you, okay? So let's bow our heads. If you want to be saved, 
Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I deserve to go to the lake of fire, but I want to change. Please forgive me of all my sins. By your blood, once for all, so I can go to heaven. Amen. Now, if you ask God to forgive you, the Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You are saved forever. You have eternal life. Okay? Shit.